Hey YouTube, my name is Natalie. I'm a criminal defense attorney and welcome to my channel. I hope that you're doing well. Today's video is going to be my analysis of the shopping cart killer case, which is a recent serial killer case that broke here in the what's called DMV area, which is DC, Maryland and Virginia metro area. Um, so Mr. Anthony Robinson, who's 35 years old, is the alleged shopping cart killer, and he is accused of abducting and murdering uh, three women and one unknown woman, Elizabeth Redmond, 54. Her name is Elaine Elizabeth Redmond, but she goes by Beth or went by Beth, 54 of Harrisonburg, Virginia, Tanita Smith, who allegedly went by Nita Smith. 39 of Charlottesville, Virginia, and Cheyenne Brown, 29 of Washington, D.C. There is another woman who was discovered deceased. However, she has not yet been identified due to the state of decomposition. So this case began breaking around September or October of 2021. It was October 12th of 2021 when 29-year-old Cheyenne Brown was reported missing from Washington, D.C. She was last seen at a D.C. metro station on September 30th of 2021, and her family reported her missing on October 12th of 2021. At the time, Cheyenne had a seven-year-old son and was also four months pregnant. Her case basically went unreported or not really talked about for a long period of time um, and not much would happen with this case until just the last few days. At the time of filming this, it is now December 28th of 2021. So on, and then on October 24th of 2021, 54-year-old Elaine Elizabeth Redmond was reported missing in the Harrisonburg, Virginia area. Her family found it very strange that she hadn't been in contact with anyone because she was purportedly a very responsible person and she had not shown up for work or been in contact with any of her family. Then on November 14th of 2021, Tanita Smith, who is a mother of six children and 39 years old, went, went missing in Charlottesville, Virginia. Her family reported her missing sometime after that. Once again, she was another person where it was very strange that she wouldn't be in touch with anyone because she had six children. Police in Harrisonburg, Virginia, which is 120 miles outside of Washington, DC, began looking for Beth Redman and Nita Smith. And these investigations were completely separate. They were not looking for them together or thinking that they had anything to do with each other, which makes sense because they're not fitting a victim profile. They don't uh, look alike. They're not in the same age range. They're not even the same race. The only thing that's the same about them is that they're women. So they were not being uh, searched for in connection with one another. On November 23rd of 2021, officers discovered the human remains of Beth Redman and Nita Smith in a vacant lot in Harrisonburg, Virginia. Their bodies were within the same vicinity of each other. So they weren't you know, directly next to each other, but they were in the same area as each other. And there was also a shopping cart that was found in the area. According to a recent press conference that was given, officers were able to find surveillance footage of an individual who was later identified as Anthony Robinson, transporting the bodies of Miss Redman and Miss Smith in a shopping cart into the wooden area. Allegedly, this was captured on surveillance footage. Officers were also able to obtain the cell phone records of Ms. Redman and Ms. Smith and apparently discovered that they had both been in communication with Mr. Robinson on a dating app. They have not specified what the dating app is. And that is how uh, both women met Mr. Robinson. They also alleged that Mr. Robinson took the two women on separate dates to hotels, which they have not named, and then murdered the women by way of blunt force trauma and then transported them to the open lot. Now, although the bodies were found together, officers believe that both women were killed at different times. On December 7th, Fairfax uh, police got a call from the Metropolitan Police Department for help looking for Cheyenne. 
Fairfax, Virginia is the county that is right outside of Washington, D.C. That's in Virginia. And Alexandria and Arlington are in Fairfax County. So it would make sense for Washington, D.C. to reach out to Fairfax County in Virginia, Prince George's County or Montgomery County in Maryland because those counties border Washington, D.C. And so on December 7th, the police in uh, D.C. who were looking for Cheyenne Brown reached out to Fairfax County. They informed Fairfax that Miss Brown had taken the Metro, which is the underground train in Virginia, from D.C. to Huntington, Huntington, from Washington, D.C. to the Huntington Metro Station. So if you're not familiar, every train in every metro train in Washington, D.C. is equipped with camera footage. And the metro runs from Washington, D.C. into certain parts of Maryland and Virginia, certainly the parts that are closest to Washington, D.C. And those trains and the platform, the station, they're all equipped with high definition camera. The only thing they don't have is audio, but it does have visual. You can see very well, it's one of the best camera systems that um, exist in public transportation. In my opinion, I get some cases um, where my clients were allegedly on a metro platform. And if the video footage is saying, you know, it identifies that person, really, um, unless the person's face is obscured, it's uh, by a mask or something like that, it's pretty easy to see a person's face as long as their face is not covered by a mask. So she got off at that Huntington station on September 30th of 2021, and she was never um, seen again. So then digital data, um, according to law enforcement, they don't say what type of digital data that was. They don't say if it's cell phone records. They don't say if it's, you know, um, you know, um, they don't say if it's, uh, they don't say if it's social media postings or postings in the app. It just says digital data, whatever that means. It could be GPS tracking location information. I have no idea. Digital data is a very nebulous type of term, but according to them, digital data put Cheyenne on the 1600 block of Fairfax Highway, which is in Virginia, at what's known as the Moon Inn. So it is a local um, hotel, motel, um, that runs on Fairfax Highway, that is situated on Fairfax Highway. So her, I would assume that the digital data they're talking about here is her GPS tracking location information. Most people's cell phone has GPS tracking ability and police can obtain either search warrants or permission or pen registers in order to tap into your GPS tracking um, information. It doesn't tell people, it doesn't tell law enforcement exactly where a person was when something happens. Instead, it says what cell tower the phone pinged off of at the time that the phone was on. The phone doesn't need to be used, like the person doesn't need to be making a phone call. The phone simply needs to be on because then the phone needs to ping off of local towers in order to receive service. So whatever tower the phone pings off of is a rough estimate of the person's location. So Miss. Brown was allegedly in the 1600 block and also on that 1600 block in that area is the Moon Inn, which is located in Fairfax, Virginia, a hotel located in Fairfax, Virginia. Local Fairfax police brought cadaver dogs out to the Moon Inn to see if they could detect the presence of human remains, which they were unable to do. So then they left. And then sometime after that, police were able to obtain the video footage from Metro Transit in which they were able to place uh, Miss Brown at the Huntington Metro stop on September 30th. And then they got a warrant for the cell phone data of Mr. Robinson. And so that cell phone data placed the defendant, Mr. Robinson, and the decedent, Miss Brown, at the same location on September 30th, according to the press conference. They don't say what the same location is, just that they're placed at the same location. Video footage was found of both Mr. Robinson and Ms. Brown in Washington, D.C. at the Metro stop on September 30th. So there was cell phone data putting them in the same location based on an approximation. So just because I ping on a cell phone tower 
at the same cell phone tower that you ping on, it doesn't necessarily mean that we've seen each other or met up with each other because again, it's just a rough estimate of you pinged off of this tower, this tower was close, close to you. That tower could be hundreds of feet away and you could be in a totally different location. But what's most problematic here for Mr. Robinson and puts the uh, police, um, I think on surer footing, as far as Ms. Brown is concerned, is that video footage um, at the DC Metro stop puts Ms. Brown and Mr. Robinson there together at the same time on September 30th, which is the day that she went missing. I will also say that NBC News 4, which is the local news station here in the Washington DC area, interviewed who they called a relative of Miss Brown. They did not identify him or say his name. They just said that he was a relative of Miss Brown. And he said that he actually saw Mr. Robinson in Miss Brown's home and chased him off a few days before she went missing. I have not heard law enforcement mention this at all. And now that doesn't mean that this is not true or this is not credible. It just means that I have not heard law enforcement mention it. So they, they could have strategic reasons for not telling certain things. I'm not sure if law enforcement is aware of that or not, but I just thought it was an interesting little factoid. So then on December 15th of 2021, law enforcement officers returned to the Moon Inn and just a little bit off the road of Route 1 in a wooded area, they discovered a shopping cart. Now, if you remember back in November of 2021, officers discovered a shopping cart and then two uh, remains, which were that of Miss Redmond and Miss Smith near a shopping cart. And they had seen allegedly video footage of the suspect, Mr. Robinson, transporting Miss Smith and Miss Redmond's dead bodies in that shopping cart. So they see the shopping cart in the woods near the hotel where the cell phone of Cheyenne's have been found and this raised their suspicions. So they got out there and they started searching and allegedly not far away from that shopping cart, they found a plastic container and inside of the plastic container, they found the human remains of Cheyenne Brown. But as horrifying as that is, it does not end there. They also found the human remains of an unidentified woman who as of the filming of this video, December 28th of 2021, they don't know who that woman is. At this point, at this point, Mr. Robinson is officially deemed to be a suspected serial killer. Law enforcement dubs him the shopping cart killer. Now, because Ms. Brown had gone missing on September 30th of 2021, and her remains were not located until December 15th of 2021, law enforcement still says that her remains are tentatively identified because she has been identified based on a tattoo on her body. She's too decomposed to make an official identification. They're going to have to wait for DNA results to come back. And if they're gonna send it to the FBI lab, um, which is where a lot of DNA is sent to in this area, that is going to be very backed up. They'll give this priority. It's a high profile murder case, but there's quite a few high profile murder cases in the area. So it doesn't happen right away, but they are tentatively identifying the human remains as those of Ms. Brown. The other woman's um, remains cannot be tentatively identified. There's no way to know who she is based on how long she's been in that barrel. They saw uh, Mr. Um, that they saw Mr. Robinson in Ms. Brown's home which leads me to think that they may have had more of a connection than that. Maybe they'd been on a few dates. I don't know. So this may not have been the first date in which he met these people and then harmed them, but it seems like the initial introduction was through these dating apps. Um, and so, you know, I, I make a bad of what you will, but I just think that that's very interesting. If it's not the first date, I know a lot of the stigma that surrounds online dating is you meet this guy, you don't know him from anywhere. And then on the first date, he does something to you. But what's probably even more terrifying is the idea of you can meet anyone anywhere. And then after a few dates, they could just turn out to be a monster. You never know. So here's my legal analysis of the case based on what we know so far. And again, Mr. Robinson is presumed innocent until proven guilty. He is currently charged in Harrisonburg County with improper disposal of a human body, two counts of that 
and two counts of first degree murder. He has not yet been charged in Fairfax County, which is where Miss Brown and the unknown woman were identified, nor has he been charged in Washington, D.C. So those are his charges that are outstanding. Currently in Harrisonburg, he has an attorney that is representing him. I looked on his case search. He now has an attorney that's entered and he's being held without bond. So on the first you know, basis, just the charges alone, which are murder, he's going to be held without bond, um, especially where the allegations are that he may be involved in the death of more than one person. There's just no way that they're going to release him. The two things that the court considers whether or not the person is a flight risk and whether or not they're a danger to the community. So far, what's known about 35-year-old Mr. Robinson is that he is a transient individual, allegedly. Now, again, just because a police officer or a chief of police or, you know, the head of the, the FBI make statements about a defendant to the media, it doesn't necessarily mean that it's true. It might just be all that law enforcement knows at the time. So maybe they make some assumptions. So there's really no way to know what Mr. Robinson's true background is. All that we know right now is that law enforcement is telling us that his background is a transient individual and that he has contacts or has addresses that go from New York all up and down the Eastern Seaboard. So New York, DC, Maryland, Virginia, that he's lived in all these different places. So when courts consider things like flight risk, they're going to look at ties to the community. If you don't have any ties to the community, you're going to be seen as a flight risk. Now, when it comes to danger to the community, the court is all the court is also going to look at the allegations, the seriousness of the allegations. You don't get any more serious than multiple murder. There's just no other serious, there's no crime that's more serious than that in the criminal justice system. And you also look at whether or not he has any criminal history. So the law enforcement said that he was shockingly lacking in a criminal history, given the seriousness of the allegations against Mr. Robinson. So that leads me to believe that there is no criminal history that they could find thus far for Mr. Robinson, you know, it could be that Robinson's an alias or he's been arrested under aliases and they're going to do investigations into that. But there's just no way to know as of right now what real criminal history he has. They're just saying that he has nothing according to what they know right now. And even though that would normally be a good thing for a criminal defendant to have no criminal history, it really is canceled out by the fact that he's charged with murder. So this case is going to be about how the police gathered the evidence. They did say that they obtained a search warrant in order to search Mr. Robinson's phone. That search warrant has to be based on probable cause to show a nexus between the crime committed and the places or thing to be searched. That means there has to be a connection between those two things in the search warrant. And so here, the officers are going to say that they applied for the search warrant to search his phone because he was found to be in communication with some of these deceased women on their own phones. And so evidence of that communication could lead to the apprehension of the person who actually killed them. I think more than likely a judge would find on later review that there was probable cause to obtain a warrant to search Mr. Robinson's phone. But, you know, there will be a question that where that will be called into question is if the police make any type of misrepresentations in the search warrant or if the police, um, you know, make leaps to judgment that, oh, because he's the person that was talking to, um, you know, Miss Redmond or Miss Smith, he has to be the person that was talking to Miss Jones or vice versa, right? They have to have some type of independent basis to believe that he had any type of connection to Miss Smith, Miss Redmond, and Miss Jones. Um, the other issue will be any statements. Now, accordingly, so far, Mr. Um, Robinson has availed himself of his Fifth Amendment right against self-incrimination, and he has not said a word. He has not said anything. So he has remained silent. So they're not going to have a statement that they'll be able to use against him. The next evidence would be DNA evidence. They will more than likely be able to get a DNA search warrant in order to assess in order to assess whether or not Mr. Robinson's DNA is on the crime scene. If they find Mr. Robinson's DNA on the crime scenes, that's pretty much it for him. You combine that with the um, with you combine that with the dating app link, and that's pretty much the nail in the coffin as far as the case is concerned. But we'll have to just wait and see. 
right? So that would be the strongest prosecution case. Um, the other thing to consider here is the joinder of the cases. So normally, if someone is charged with multiple offenses, the baseline is that the cases should be separate from one another, especially if they have different incident dates and different victims. However, if the state can show that there's a common modus operandi, then it is possible that the prosecution will be able to try all of the cases together. The only issue will be the ones that allegedly happen in other jurisdictions. So Harrisonburg is really far from Fairfax County. So it's unlikely that the trial for Miss for the death, it's unlikely that the trial for the murder of Miss Jones will be combined with the trials for the murder of Miss Redman and Miss Smith. However, whatever evidence was introduced for the trial of the murder of Miss Jones would likely be admissible in the trials against Redman and Smith to prove identification, meaning to prove that Mr. Robinson is the one that committed all of these crimes. Normally prior bad acts of other offenses don't come in against a defendant because they're too unfairly prejudicial. However, if there's evidence that there is a common MO way of committing the crime, then that evidence can be admissible. So here, the law enforcement press conference clearly said that there is a common MO amongst all of these crimes. And that is meeting on a dating website, taking them to a hotel, beating them, putting them in a shopping cart, and then taking them to their final resting place. That's, that's about how the officer put it at the press conference. So if the law enforcement is able to get evidence of that and the prosecution is able to prove that at a trial beyond a reasonable doubt, excuse me, and if the prosecution is able to make a prima facie or on its face showing of this connection towards a modus operandi, then the evidence will be mutually admissible in all of the trials. And certainly the trial for the murders of Redmond and Smith would be tried together. That's very important to defense attorneys because when you combine cases together, it makes it easier for the prosecution to obtain a conviction. By and large, there could be some, by and large, there could be some exceptions to that, but rarely are there exceptions to that. Usually it makes it very easy for the prosecution or easier for the prosecution to be able to show this common scheme, this MO. It has to be almost like showing a signature and a serial killer case is a classic case of showing a signature modus operandi between how one how a person commits a crime in one situation versus another situation to show that this is a serial killer offense. There's not a serial killer crime, so you can't be charged as a serial killer, but the fact that someone has a common way in which they commit a crime can be used against the person at trial to show that this is the person that you're looking for. And that can make it a lot easier for the prosecution to be able to prove their case. Another concern here is that there could be other victims and you know, people out here. Women have already been in contact with law enforcement to inform them that they've been on dates with this gentleman on dating apps. And so law enforcement is asking for anyone to come forward if they have any information about Mr. Robinson um, and going on dates with him or have met him or anything like that. Um, they are concerned that there are other women out there who have been killed by him but have not yet been found or identified, like the woman who was found in the barrel with Miss Jones. So those are my thoughts on the case. It's really going to come down to a it's really going to come down to meticulous and neat policing not letting their emotions get the better of them because it's such a horrific case and the allegations are so horrible you know sometimes uh law enforcement officers can like human beings let their emotions get the better of them and uh maybe uh be a little sloppy in evidence collection or something like that it's very important to dot all the i's and cross all the t's get the search warrants put the gloves on get the dna tests and if they're able to do it that way, then they should be able to secure a conviction. Also, if the things that they've told the media are actually true, then they should be able to secure a conviction based on what they've told us so far. But if there are any, ish if there are any problems with securing the search warrant, 
uh, meaning that maybe there was something put in the search warrant that wasn't true or the search warrant is based on, um, you know, doesn't show a nexus between Mr. Robinson and the the um, events. Um, if the video footage doesn't show a face clearly, it just shows a body, for example, and they identify Mr. Robinson through other means that could also undermine the prosecution. So right now at this time in the case, it's all about evidence collection. And as long as they can collect the evidence um, in the appropriate way, and preserve all of Mr. Robinson's rights, there should be some type of just conclusion to this case. I would love to know what you guys think based on the limited information that we have so far. And I love to talk to you guys in the comment section. So comment down below and I'll talk to you later. Bye.